Okay. <clears throat> okay, I'll, I'll begin. Namaste, good evening to all our participants connected today from across the world. Namaste, good evening to all our participants connected today from across the world. On behalf of Central Zoo Authority and Sri Chamarajendra Zoological Gardens, I extend a warm welcome to all our listener participants who have joined us today from across the globe. This is a sixth in series of the webinars that we have initiated to reach out to the zoo community on topics that are of mutual interest and all new global experts who are well known and respected in this field. Today, through this digital form, we bring to you some very esteemed speakers to discuss and dwell upon the aspect of enrichment for animal welfare. So at the onset, I would like to welcome Dr. S.P. Yadav, uh, IFS, and additional DG Forest for Project Tiger, and Member Secretary, National Tiger Conservation Authority and Central Zoo Authority. Due to his continued support, we have been able to continue with specific topics and experts from across the globe to the zoo community for the last three months. And he himself has been instrumental in steering tiger conservation in its range countries and capacity building initiatives to strengthen ex situ and into in situ linkages. So over to you, sir, for your opening remarks. Uh, thank you so much, Sonali, and a very good evening to all participants as well as the speakers. Uh, this webinar, the topic looks me very apt, the enrichment of animal welfare. In fact, animal welfare I consider is as it is most one of the most important fundamental pillar of captive wildlife management anywhere in the world. About uh, CZA, Central Zoo Authority in India is a statutory body, unlike other countries. This is a regulatory body and uh, in fact, in India, no zoo can be created or can operate without approval of Central Zoo Authority. This has got legal power to regulate functions of zoo management in the country. Uh, besides regulatory functions, we also provide technical support, funding support, and capacity building support to all our zoos across the country. And in this way, we are moving from a facilit uh, regulatory role to a facilitator role as well. We are also a member of uh, the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And the main function of CZA is to recognize uh, zoo for operations. And when I say zoo, it also includes rescue facilities, rescue centers, and circus also, wherever the animals are exhibited. Uh, are displayed to the public. We basically oversee working conditions of zoo across the country. We do evaluation, we do monitoring, and ensure that minimum standards of captive animal management in these zoos are maintained. Uh, we are also looking into the one plan approach, like from ex situ to in situ connection as uh, supported by the IUCN. And we, we are trying to ensure the professional management of wildlife in captivity. Uh, next slide, please. As you, most of you are aware, uh, we have large number of zoos in the country. There are 152. As you can see in the map, they are spread across uh, all, all parts of the country. And uh, very large number of people visit our zoo, uh, around seven to eight million people annually visit our zoo, and mostly it is a very good center uh, for awareness and outreach for the children and uh, aged people who cannot visit our national parks, sanctuaries, and tiger reserves. Next, please. If you see, we uh, in, in captivity, we keep the wild animals. And wild animals, uh, they, they enjoy a beautiful habitat in the wild. But when we keep them in captivity, they're highly stressed. Uh, for example, restriction on movement of uh, movement, their movement, restriction on the space. If you see a tiger, 
tiger in india has its ter tiger is territorial animal and most of the animals are territorial so tiger is a territorial animal and one tiger occupies on an average 20 square kilometer to 200 square kilometer in our country and if you see the uh, range of tiger in countries like russia the siberian tiger their range uh, extends from 200 to 1200 to 1500 square kilometer so this kind of territorial animal when we keep in captivity then it becomes uh, they, they become highly stressed and it becomes our responsibility to provide them as natural as close possible uh, environment to them similarly the improper social grouping in animals that is that is the limitation in the captivity uh, include barren enclosures I always say that if you want to keep lion in the captivity, you must create habitat, mini habitat, micro habitat of lion in, in the captive, captive facility. And similarly, this, this is true for all, all, all wild animals. Then um, these animals are stressed due to uh, visitors also. And constantly they are interacting in the wild, they hardly interact with uh, human presence. But here they they are exposed to visitors constantly also this also creates uh, creates a stress and and uh, in in captivity there is a routine kind of uh, uh, days for them routine kind of routine uh, uh, for all wild animals for that for example like meals they are served on particular time but it doesn't happen in wild like if you see the tiger it hunts when it is hungry when it it, it needs food and uh, hunts mostly once in a week or once in a four to six, uh, seven days. So here they, they are conditioned to the captivity. So it becomes our responsibility to provide them uh, uh, natural conditions, enrichment, so that, that can, they can stimulate, stimulate, uh, stimulate, them, stimulate them for their normal behavior. Next slide, please. So uh, the enrichment philosophy is about environment enrichment, process for improving, enhancing zoo animal, and basically their behavior, because they are kept in captivity, their phenotypic uh, and genetic divergence sometimes that is reflected, and the behavior changes. I have seen uh, when I was DFO Agra and when I rescued uh, this dancing bears and handed over it to Agra Bear Rescue Facility, and then we saw that their swinging of head, that behavior that continued for years together. So the enrichment philosophy is that provide such kind of enrichment that stimulates the natural behavior in the animal. And again, it's not one-time process. It's a dynamic and it should keep on changing it should keep on improving based on the experience with animals. Next slide, please. So everyone, all the zoo managers know about the objectives of enrichment. Uh, the animal welfare is, as I said, it's a fundamental pillar of captive animal management, and this should become the first priority. Animal enclosure, although we have standards, minimum standards we are ensuring in India, but they should have enough space for animals to show their normal behaviors and they should not feel insecure. That is one of the most important uh, security and uh, reproduction. These two aspects, two needs of wild animals are most important to which, which govern their behavior and all. So the objective is, objectives are reduce aberrant behaviors, reduce the stress related uh, captivity in captivity, display species typical behavior patterns like every animal has typical behavior uh, and, and we should try to create circumstances or environment where they show their normal behavior uh, increase in activity level of animals in, in in fact in captivity there are many animals we do not reproduce and then the reason behind this is they do not get enough uh, stimulation in captivity and probably the enrichment is one of the solutions to enhance productivity or reproductive ability of these animals in the captivity. Next slide please. 
in, in fact, CJD has been trying to build capacity of zoo managers in the country. Several publications, uh, we uh, the CJD has already issued. They come out with uh, several publications, and they are in public domain. But there is no end to it. As I said, it's a dynamic process. There are n, n number of possibilities of making life of these captive animals uh, happy. So uh, enrichment provides. Uh, makes life of these animals happy and uh, close to nature. I'm looking forward for uh, both the presentations, uh, which I'm sure they're going to be very ex uh, exciting. Uh, with these words, uh, I welcome again all uh, speakers and as well as the participants, and thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir, and you have set the tone for the webinar today, and as you have said that this is a dynamic process, and uh, let us now hear from our expert uh, speakers and uh, get to know the best practices that are followed across zoos in the world. So now I welcome uh, Ms. Georgina Groves, uh, Executive Director of Wild Welfare, an international agency dedicated to improving captive wild animal welfare. Uh, Ms. Georgina has over 20 years of experience working for animal welfare, research and conservation organizations. Uh, she has, uh, uh, she and her team has been working in several uh, projects across uh, zoos, especially on exotic captive animal welfare in Pakistan, Japan, and South America. She is a member of the Zoological Society of London's Animal Welfare Committee uh, and also the Species Survival Network uh, uh, for the animals in captivity working groups. And uh, she continues to uh, be associated with uh, Bristol University and the Natural History Museum, London. So over to you, Georgina, and look forward uh, to hearing from you about your experiences. Thank you very much. Can I check that my screen is showing? Yes, please. Yes, it is. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you very much um, for the invitation and the opportunity to speak um, to Z CZA. Um, this is very exciting for me to be able to share the work that I do. So today I'm going to talk to you about enrichment and animal welfare, but in particular focusing on the importance of promoting optimal welfare through three specific areas, which is comfort, choice and control within the environment. But firstly, I want to briefly consider the various reasons as to why animal welfare needs to be a priority for zoos and aquariums in the 21st century. Firstly, animals in zoos should be afforded the opportunity to thrive. And we have that ethical obligation to consider the welfare of all our animals and provide them with that respectful environment which promotes those conditions of optimal welfare. But secondly, there are also implications for good business practice. Good animal welfare supports biological functioning. So, for example, high standards of welfare improves reproductive success, survivability and longevity. We also have that social license or responsibility. We, of course, have our moral duties, but zoos are also judged on consequentialism. Essentially, we're judged on our actions rather than what we say. And there is increased scrutiny and changing perceptions about how animals should be kept from the, by the public and also by our sponsors. There's increased research also that shows people want to make ethical choices. And in the current socio-political socio climate, there's growing pressure for businesses such as zoos to be transparent and active in ethical practice. The humane economy, seeing animals live well, drives visitation. The rationale for visiting zoos and demand from the visitor has changed over time. In the past, it was just about show me as many animals as possible. And today it's about how we care for those animals. In the future, it's going to be much more about how we connect and how we have an empath empathetic connection with those animals. So zoos nowadays are here to educate and help consumers, i.e. the public, make better more conscious choices. But what do we actually mean about welfare? Welfare now is about thriving. It's not just about surviving and it's about ensuring an animal has a good life. Animal welfare is a concept that has a diversity of definitions and perhaps quite often a lot more misunderstandings. 
And it's only really been studied properly in the past few decades. And the perceptions of animal welfare are culturally sensitive. They're globally variable and subject to change through time. And it has actually been stated that there's no consensus of how to measure the welfare status of an animal objectively. However, ideas about animal welfare have evolved to the point where there's now general agreement amongst all the experts that there's increased emphasis on the effective state or the emotional capacity of an animal for them to have a good life. And we must, you must, as animal carers, provide animals with consistent positive experiences and positive effective states. And the ability to have an emotional capacity isn't just limited to those higher charismatic species. Even uh, the humble fish is highly evolved. Um, they've been shown to have uh, fear, excitement, anger, pleasure, and anxiety. Their brain, brain produce compounds that accompany the same emotions in mammals. So we must consider the animal's capacity to experience positive and negative, negative emotions when we're designing their environments and their enrichment. How can we encapsulate effective or emotional states and use them to understand good animal welfare? The five domains model, which I'm sure many of you are very familiar with, um, is a framework focusing device to help facilitate systematic, structured and comprehensive and coherent assessment of animal welfare. It's not a definition of animal welfare, but the purpose of each of those five domains, nutrition, environment, health, behavior, and the mental state, is to draw attention to areas that are relevant to both animal welfare assessment and management. And one of the main differences between, say, this model and the five freedom model, which is also a very popular animal welfare model, is that the five domain model considers the promotion of positive experiences, such as pleasure of eating or drinking or rewarding engagement, and not just the mitigation of poor experiences, just thirst or hunger, boredom or frustration. But like us, and this is really important, no animal will solely experience positive experience throughout its entire life, and it will fluctuate on an hour, daily, monthly basis. And therefore, a quality of life is determined by ex examining the balance between those negative and positive experiences we provide them. Functionally, this means environments should facilitate and promote positive welfare experiences specific to that individual. These environments should elicit positive feelings, for these animals, such as contentment and satisfaction and engagement, and mitigate or reduce those negative welfare experiences specific to the individual, such as fear or chronic stress. And I've identified three main areas that this can be provided through the care, environment, and enrichment that we provide them. These are the three C's, as I call them, comfort, choice, and control. And I want to look at those in bit more detail and consider them when we're talking about animal enrichment. So comfort, providing in comfort encompasses a lot of the aspects of those daily care provisions that we give animals that provide for their basic biological functioning. It's about creating an environment that creates satisfaction with a social and physical environment while providing appropriate health services. Physical, social and behavioural comfort can result in those positive experiences I'm talking about and positive effective states and therefore good welfare. So positive social interactions, security provisions, refuge and shelters, appropriate thermoregulation, appropriate food and water to be provided. And of course, appropriate safety, both proactive health care and protection from injury. What do we mean by choice? Well, Traditionally, if you think about it, where zoo animals are housed, where they spend their time, and often what they do is controlled and determined by us. However, research has shown that when animals are given choice, they find that all animals have their own individual preferences and it reduces stress. So, for example, when giant pandas were typically, who are typically kept in an outside enclosure, were given the choice to go into a small room away from the public they were less agitated and showed a decrease in stress. Polar bears showed positive behavioural changes and less abnormal behaviours when they were given the choice of indoor space. And goats and sheep in a petting zoo were given the option of retreat or refuge space 
showed lots uh, showed a lower rate of undesirable behaviors when they had no other than when they had no such space understanding captive animal preferences can be really valuable when we're designing environments enrichment for them and providing animals with the ability to make choices within their space will enhance their well-being so what sort of choices are important well, you would first consider what's important to that animal. How have they evolved? What did they? What natural environment did they evolve in? What behaviours are a priority to them? And then you consider individual preferences because individuals within within a species will have different preferences. So choices might be about access to space. It might be different substrates that you provide them for comfort. It might be an opportunity for different social options, making friendship groups, choices of mate choices to retreat away and be on their own. Choices of different foods, do you provide them with the same food each time or do you give them a variety of choices? Just want to show you this video, which is a nice example of two bears who are given straw in two separate indoor areas, but they had the choice to be together. And as you'll see by this bear, he moves all his straw and bedding to actually be with the other bear. So he had the choice to be on his own or be with his brother. It was his brother and he chose to be with his brother. This is a really important point. Having the choice can be more important than using the choice. So pandas, again, using their off exhibit room, they only used it for 33% of available time. And the polar bears only used the off exhibit space for 2% of available time. In all those zoo-based studies, the animals showed positive responses to being provided with the ability to make a choice, irrespective of whether they exercised that choice. And this has been really important, again, with environment and enrichment design, as it may be that even if those, the enrichment isn't used, having the choice to use it is enough to, uh, to recreate positive welfare experiences. How is control different to choice? Choice lets an animal react to its environment, while control allows an animal to proactively change its environment. And I think this is really best exemplified by, again, this video. This is from Zoos Victoria in Australia. And this individual triggered the hose and the water to go off so that it could cool down, but it only went off when the animal moved past the water. So that individual had the choice and control in its environment. It could control whether it wanted to get wet or not, and it could control whether it wanted to cool or not. So all three C's, comfort, choice, and control, are a really good starting to point to consider when building an enrichment plan. And we want enrichment to support consistent opportunities for positive, effective states by encouraging natural and normal behaviors in captive, in captive animals. Remember, we're trying to ensure animals are thriving in captivity as opposed to being either frustrated, stressed, or both. An animal will be frustrated if the environment doesn't let the animal express its normal behaviors. An animal will be stressed if it is put in an environment where it's very different to the one it evolved in and it cannot cope. However, an animal will thrive if the environment offers choice and control that allows the animal to perform those natural and normal positive behaviors. But how do we know what an animal actually wants? There's a number of different behaviors that animals will carry out. So how do we know which one are strongly motivated, they're what's strongly motivated to carry out? Well, we can do something called preference testing. Effectively, we can test the willingness of an animal to work for resources. 
This gate here is a very hard gate to push through, but you'll see that this cow forces its way through because it knows that it has this scratching post the other side. And this is an example of preference or motivational testing. This animal was very motivated to get to this scratching post, which we, so we would therefore know that this is a strong behavioral need for this individual. However, there is a catch to this. The relative strength of preference for an animal can differ according to various things. So what other available options might be available, the time of the day, or other immediate needs at the time. An example of this is um, from cockroaches. Um, it was in a study, cockroaches preferred to rest in little small groups in darker locations. However, when robot cockroaches were introduced to the group, they started valuing much larger social groups in light conditions. So their preferences where they rested changed depending on the size of the social group. And that's just worth considering when trying to understand what behavioral preferences an animal has. So animal enrichment, we're aiming for thriving. Animal welfare is characterized by that animal environment interaction. And first of all, you must really understand the behavioral biology of that species. Also understand the individual preferences of that animal. And then you design an effective enrichment and program incorporating that above knowledge. Basic, there's two sort of forms of enrichment as I see it. There's basic husbandry um, uh, enrichment, which is essentially provisions of basic um, physical uh, environmental infrastructure, substrate, resting barrows, branches, heat lamps for warmth, which provides for that comfort element of um, a good environment. You've then also got the actual physical changing enrichment. So when biological requirements are met, Environments then can be enriched by offering greater choice and control, which results to challenge. Challenge and complexity can include things such as an unpredictable regime. It can include a challenge like working for your food, and it can include cognitive and sensory enrichment. And it increases an animal's feeling of control over itself and the environment if it has an appropriate challenge. But appropriate is really important. Um, it needs to be appropriate for that species and that individual. An animal needs to be able to build resilience and coping ability so it can develop um, an ability to overcome those challenges. So there's a fine line. You can have a challenge which isn't enough, it isn't much of a challenge, and it will result in boredom and understimulation, and the welfare won't be optimal. You can have a challenge which is just right, which stimulates the animal appropriately and you have welfare, uh, optimal welfare. Or you can have a challenge which is too much, it's too frequent, it's too intense, it's too difficult. And an animal is unable to overcome it and it can become frustrated and stressed. And that's again a really important rule to remember when you're providing enrichment for your animals. There are many forms of enrichment that can be provided for but just remember that enrichment should be based around the animal's behavior that satisfies a specific need. These needs are based on the species evolved behavioral needs and the individual preferences. We don't have time to go through all forms of those different enrichment uh, types, but I do wanna consider a few enrichment ideas from a perspective of those three Cs, comfort, choice, and control. Food enrichment is a very obvious and simple enrichment opportunity. In most animals, food is a very powerful motivator of behavior. So it's no surprise that the manner and timing of feeding affects the behavior in captive animals. We have to feed them. So we, have to, we want to ensure that what we feed them and how we feed them meets their biological function and also provides choice and control. It should be species appropriate and safe. There should be a provision of different food choices and it should be provided in a manner that allows the animal to choose when and where to eat. And all of these can result in positive experiences. Just a, a, a quick unpublished study in Payton Zoo in the UK. When scatter feeding was provided for tapia, um, there was significant increase in closure use and positive activity by the tapia. So this is just a simple change in how the animals were fed and it resulted in positive welfare experiences. And it's not just the charismatic, as you remember, this is an example 
of a fish having enrichment, just being fed its food, which was hidden in a kong. So it just had to do a little bit of work for that food. And it was just a little bit more interesting than sprinkling the food on the top of the water. Fish are rarely given the same compassion or welfare as our warm blooded vertebrates, but they have that sentient capacity and it's really important to consider enrichment for all species. When we're talking about food, how we feed them is so important. And again, this is just a quick video, um, which I believe is an example of how not to feed a species. So these chimpanzee are being publicly fed as an exhibit. And as you'll notice, the chimps are clapping their hands for the food, which is essentially a begging behavior. Now they have a, what looks like a really fantastic enclosure to use. However, due to the nature of how they're being fed, they're actually showing stereotypical or abnormal behaviors. So while the experience may be positive for those watching as humans, it's not necessarily positive for those chimpanzees. This video, on the other hand, taken at Wildlife Reserves Singapore, is a really nice example of a chimpanzee having to use a tool and its cognitive abilities to get the food. Apologies for the chatting in the background. So that was interesting for that individual and it reduced boredom and it was species appropriate. So the most important aspect of feeding enrichment is to consider how would that species source and eat food in the wild. And when thinking about food presentation and food enrichment, there's another interesting concept to take into account about how to present food and that's contra freeloading concept. This is where an animal is provided with a choice between making an effort to obtain food when it's eaten from or by eating it from a freely available source. And quite often animals will choose to work for that food. And this video is quite a nice example. And what you'll hopefully note from this is that there's a carrot on top of that box, which that giraffe could have eaten. So it didn't need to work for that food. Why do they do this? It allows the animal to express species specific behaviors. And it's a really useful and simple, quite often simple enrichment tool. And so consider what animals would benefit most from free, contra free loading in your facility. What animals can least perform their natural foraging behaviors at the moment? Substrate is also one of the easiest forms of enrichment that can be provided, but still is seriously utilized in zoos. And I want to consider it from the perspective of the resting behavior of animals. Many facilities still don't fully appreciate how valuable good and appropriate substrate actually can be. Resting behaviors are an essential component of animal welfare. And in a relatively recent study, showed that African elephants who spent any amount of time housed on all hard substrate slept a lot less, they didn't lie down. Asian elephants who spent any amount of time housed on all soft substrate slept a lot more do during the day. The ability to lie down and rest is incredibly important and the influence of flooring substrate is important to recumbent rest and by extension zoo elephant welfare, and by that extension to all zoo animal welfare. And it doesn't need to necessarily involve mess. A lot of the facilities that I work with are worried about the mess that substrates such as sand or soil or bark chips might cause. But actually you can also create really simple um, beds for animals. Indoor spaces where animals are kept a significant portion of the time are inherently sterile. 
These simple beds that we helped a zoo in Thailand make, make, uh, make are really great, not just for resting components, but also for the individual physical health. They're practical, they're movable, they're multifunctional, and they're really also great for geriatric animals that need something lower to get on. Just another study which was done again at Paynton Zoo um, um, and through the EASA office, the European Association of Zoos and Crimes office, the introduction of bark significantly reduced aggression in the baboon uh, enclosure, also significantly increased play, a positive um, behavioural experience within this group. And that was just by the introduction of new substrate. Planning enrichment. So importantly, you want to set goals and these are going to be behaviourally focused. What behaviours do you want to encourage or discourage and how can you do that? You think about the animal's natural history, you think about the individual preferences. However, perhaps even more importantly than goal setting is about addressing animal motivation. What are our animals motivated to do and how are we going to give those animals the opportunity to do them? You would then plan a formal process involving all your stakeholders about your enrichment programme and you create a framework and implement it. You'd implement that, you'd document and observe, and you'd evaluate, did you meet that goal? Are the animals able to be carrying out those motivated behaviours? If not, why not? And how can you readjust it? Evaluation is an incredibly critical point, both from the insurance of um, ensuring the enrichment programme is um, successful, but also that it's safe. Few things to consider, which is sometimes forgotten when um, creating an enrichment program: life cycle variations. Animals will need uh, very have, have very different needs, varying on their lifespan. Young animals will want different things to old animals, and we have an aging zoo population, and therefore we need to consider their needs and behavioural wants. You also want to consider your animals' behavioural, sorry, breeding requirements. This could be providing them with opportunities to choose a mate or engage in courtship rituals, provide nesting or denning areas and materials. Other things to consider are seasonal variations. What type of seasonal changes your animals would experience in its natural habitat? Varying temperature and lighting in the enclosure can be enriching or providing access to sprinklers or humidifiers to stimulate rainfall. Also think about the seasonal variation at your own zoo. Can the animals access outdoor enclosures throughout the winter? Or does it get hot enough where you are in the summer to make cooling opportunities necessary and do you provide them? And again, things to consider, enrichment isn't just for those charismatic species. A study by Bashaw in 2016, they gave five types of environmental enrichment to leopard geckos. And those leopard geckos interacted with all five types, although firmer regulation and feeding appeared more effective than novel enrichment. But however, the overall improvement of using enrichment, uh, environmental enrichment showed there was improvement in welfare. And this is really important because quite often we will give animals a very compromised space in captivity. For an example, this is the kind of environment where wild bearded dragons live. However, this is a very typical sort of vivarium that we provide them. It's going to be very hard to meet those behavioural needs in a space like this. And therefore, another consideration is, can your facility recreate and meet those behavioural needs? And if not for that species, should we be keeping them? Another really important um, enrichment opportunity is retreat space. Um, why is retreat space enriching? Well, it can reduce that stress and that frustration and it allows an animal to have choice and agency over its space. One of the behavioural opportunities that is severely limited for animal, animals in captivity is their ability to move away from one another or from humans. And that lack of significant retreat space is a significant stressor for captive animals. Adding retreat spaces improves indicators of animal welfare and in many cases it has shown that a reduction of distress provided by the addition of retreat space is directly related to the need to cope with a potential threat. So for example animals will show preference for retreat space that is easily defended. So it may not be the quantity of space 
provided, but the complexity of the space that affords that animal, um, that affords an animal that determines enclosure impact on its well-being. So again, retreat space or refuges are shown by the experiments also with pandas and polar bears and um, goats and uh, sheep in the petting zoo is really important. And finally, enrichment doesn't stop at the end of the day. Quite often, animals will spend more hours held inside their indoor spaces in a zoo than outdoor. Up to 17, 18 hours can be spent indoors. So night quarters or indoor areas need to be designed in a similar manner to the outdoor outside public display areas. And similar or more enrichment, a stronger enrichment program should be uh, considered within that indoor space. I've rushed through this because I'm conscious of the time, um, but I hope that covered um, uh, enough for everybody. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Georgina. That was fantastic. And especially for me, it was very enriching, uh, especially to understand that welfare is not surviving, but it's also about uh, thriving uh, now. And your three C's, which was on comfort, choice, and control, have beautifully summed up what we need to look for animal welfare. So thank you so much. And uh, we will uh, have uh, some questions for you, but perhaps at the end of the webinar, given the time. Yeah. Uh, so now, uh, yes, thank you. And thank I will you. now uh, request our new, uh, next speaker, uh, which is Dr. Avanti uh, Malapur. Uh, she is an alumnus of uh, Wildlife Institute of India, where she did her master's. And then she completed her doctoral work from University of Edinburgh for studying the influence of visitor presence on behavior of captive lion-tailed macaques housed in Indian zoos. So Avanti, hopefully many of the zoo uh, community people that you have interacted with during your thesis time uh, are listening today to you. And uh, you firmly believe in zoo's uh, primary role in education. So we look forward to hearing uh, from you as to how you manage uh, your zoo as the curator of Mickey Grove Zoo. Over to you. Thank you very much, Sunali. Um, and I thank all the Central Zoo Authority staff for inviting me to make this presentation today. And I'm really excited to share my experience with the audience. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to share a, a variety of enrichment items and strategies that we use at our facility. Before that, I would like to um, introduce uh, behavior and the link between behavior and enrichment and why uh, environmental enrichment is a key focus is in the zoo community. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, to begin with, we're going to look at a variety of behavioral uh, types. And to define behavior itself, uh, like, it, uh, like it was um, defined by Georgina in her presentation, behavior and behavioral needs are um, a way that an animal adapts to its uh, native environment. And a key focus in the zoo community today has been um, to design enclosures and exhibits in, um, inside zoos uh, to be more naturalistic and to kind of mimic an animal's natural habitat because that would um, help the animal and motivate an animal to display species-specific behavior. But to begin with, um, we have a variety of types of behavior that are displayed by animals. You have instinctive behavior, which is heritable, and it's a behavior that animals are born with when they hatch or when they are born. Um, in comparison to a behavior that is gained through learning in um, more evolved species. And um, both the learning behavior, it, it tends to be influenced by an animal's uh, ability to adapt to the environment it is living in. And the way this influences the zoo community is that a large portion of a zoo's goals, and I think it's safe to say that most zoos have a common goal of protecting threatened wildlife through conservation, research, and education. And one of the key goals to address these issues is to provide uh, animal residents in, in zoos 
with an ability to uh, display natural behaviors, including reproductive behaviors. And many a time it is observed that a large proportion of their behaviors are displaced in captive environments. Next slide, please. Um, so the first thing we're going to do um, is we're going to define enrichment and what enrichment is exactly. It's a very simple uh, topic and it basically is um, an husbandry principle that helps to enhance an animal's need and quality of life in, um, in animal exhibits and in animal enclosures. At Mickey Grove Zoo, the animal staff have uh, tried to provide the opportunity by providing enclosure complexity, and we're going to go through this um, over the next few slides. Next slide, please. Um, environmental enrichment itself has um, a positive influence on animal behavior. I've had the fortunate opportunity to, um, to actually conduct research on a threatened species of primate in India. And I did notice that animal behavior is definitely affected by the enclosures that they live in, um, about uh, by the habitat that they have, by the nutrition, as well as by veterinary care. Next slide, please. To begin with, most animal care staff in our uh, zoo have designed each exhibit and they receive support from animal management um, to, uh, uh, to basically uh, be as naturalistic as possible. And a key, key fact in that is that uh, the staff need to have a sound understanding of the behavioral biology of each species that is housed in the zoo. As you can see, there's a diversity of behaviors that are displayed by a variety of animals. For example, we have species that are highly arboreal, and in such cases, their exhibits are designed to include small trees and shrubs so that it motivates them to uh, climb. Uh, we also have provided with permanent that help them to climb as well. With certain species that are more fossorial, we have an ability to, um, we have given them an ability to hide out, and we've also provided uh, a variety of substrates that they can dig into. Next slide, please. Right, please, yeah. Um, to some of the examples that we've given, uh, also along with the exhibits, we provide dens and nest, nest boxes. These are designed and, uh, and customized depending on the species that they are built for. Certain species that are far more arboreal, that like, for example, the Waldrop ibises are elevated, um, and with other species, um, like some of our reptilian um, animal residents, such as the snakes, they are more uh, level to the ground. We also have some native nocturnal species, like the ringtail, um, that have both boxes and dens that are elevated and at the ground level. And th this information, again, is shared from a uh, and from publications that we have access to. Next slide, please. Um, substrate is a very important feature in most of animal exhibits. Um, it not only um, provides an animal an experience that is um, uh, uh, closer to their natural habitats, but it also has um, uh, influences their health condition. Um, for example, there are several species that uh, have certain specific types of substrates they need to prevent uh, uh, foot-related health issues like photodermatitis. Um, a variety of substrates are used also uh, in form of enrichment um, that help uh, animals uh, and motivate animals to display exploratory and foraging behaviors. Um, in some species, we do provide uh, nesting materials that motivate uh, birds to build nests and in turn motivate them to display uh, uh, reproductive behaviors. Next slide, please. Uh, 
the facility uh, nutrition is a fairly important feature a large uh, proportion of an animal's um, nutrients are given to them through their diets their medications are also supplied to them through the diets and we make sure that the diets are nutritive and they and well balanced uh, which is another influence um, on their behavior next slide please Um, and those are the key crux features um, that we use, but apart from those permanent features that happen on a regular basis, we also try as much as possible to use simple enrichment techniques uh, that help motivate animals to display natural behaviors. And the reason for this is uh, to provide them with an opportunity to display natural species specific behaviors that we could uh, share this information with our visiting public, but also give the animals an opportunity to um, display reproductive behaviors and to breed for um, many of these species are threatened and um, are involved in breeding programs. So our enrichment at Mickey Grove Zoo are built with a key focus of motivating animals to display um, exploratory behaviors and um, I will be going through different types of enrichment items and enrichment strategies that we use um, and each one is focused on a certain behavioral goal and what we also do along with designing and implementing enrichment is that we closely monitor the enrichment and we evaluate on how successful or unsuccessful it is. And this information is imperative because it gives us a sound understanding on whether a specific enrichment type is successful with a specific species, how long can we use it with that species, and how often do we have to change it out. You have to keep in mind that enrichment items can, um, uh, can um, uh, create a certain behaviors. There are also certain safety issues that need to be taken into account and animals do get habituated to enrichment items, um, which is one of the main reasons why we often change items, enrichment items in each exhibit and provide animals with new exciting methods to display behavior. Um, the first type of enrichment that we use are environmental and these are structural features that are temporarily included in each exhibit. These structural features are included at various positions inside the exhibit and they can be moved around. And most of these are fairly easy to design um, at our facility. Uh, most of our environmental features have been, uh, environmental items have been designed in house. For example, we have a huge thicket of bamboo. We use uh, bamboo to create mini ladders, as you can see here, the fire staff, um, have donated large quantities of fire hose to us um, and uh, we get them in uh, freely. We have designed hammocks and a whole array of enrichment items through retired fire hoses. Now these hammocks, interestingly enough, can be used in a variety of exhibits because as you can see, the most species display resting behaviors. Um, and hammocks could be used by a variety of species uh, uh, from carnivores to ungulates to even primates. But where do you, uh, where do you um, uh, put up the hammock is uh, finally depends on the animal's behavioral biology. Next slide, please. Another form of enrichment that we use heavily is sensory. Um, and these behaviors are really unique and we have observed that these behaviors are very rarely displayed by our animal residents and many of us and animal care staff focus on um, sensory enrichment and it's fairly easy to design as you can see um, I haven't worked with tortoises before but I'm fascinated to see that radiated tortoises um, enjoy having a back scratch and it was very easy for us to come up with an enrichment design 
that could help them. We've got some really old um, brushes that were placed. And um, again, the tortoises, most of our animals are given a choice on whether they want to use their enrichment. And when we monitor and evaluate our enrichment items, we have um, observed that most often they uh, they use them right in the start. But we have had several enrichment items that have been un unsuccessful, and um, we have um, we have noted the reasons for their uh, failure. Um, in some cases, with some species of birds, our parrots, for example, enjoy showers, and that's a sensory enrichment we use very often, especially on hot summer days. Um, a very creative sensory enrichment that we've used with our carnivores are um, scents of prey species, such as urine, or uh, used hammocks from a, a from an exhibit from a prey species that are placed in a bobcat exhibit, bird exhibit. Many a time we use um, a, a dash of spices that are sprayed on the exhibit. Again, any time a new enrichment device is in the exhibit, it's scrutinized and it is approved by a committee. We always look at safety concerns because every enrichment item could have some safety concern and that needs to be addressed prior to a new enrichment being administered to a animal exhibit. Next slide, please. Um, we heavily use manipulative devices because we strongly believe that manipulative devices provide animals with an opportunity to develop their cognitive capacity. And also that's something that we have to closely monitor because we have, we mostly use man manipulative enrichment devices with animals that are more evolved, um, such as primates, uh, carnivores to a given degree, and um, we also use them, uh, use such devices with our parrots. Um, I've also included a video clip on the left for the FUSA. As you can see, it was a very similar, uh, simple manipulative device. Um, if you could click on the FUSA video, please. As you can see, it was just a tiny piece of log that was attached, <coughs> excuse me, onto a bunch, and the FUSA uh, spins the next half an hour um, trying to um, maneuver the log. Um, you, um, are you able to click on the um, FUSA video? I wasn't sure. Um, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, most, of, most of the enrichment devices we have built, um, they're cost effective and we looked around our zoo to find very simple procedures to come up with enrichment devices. This is just a small log and um, um, that has been attached to a limb of, uh, of a tree. And um, the FUSAs are obligate carnivores. They are endemic to Madagascar and very closely related to our um, uh, canids and felids. And this enrichment device um, was uh, fairly successful with them and it motivated them to display exploratory behavior, um, which had greatly helped us uh, keeping them occupied. Our, our largest challenge were with carnivores that are highly active um, and we needed to find um, a variety of methods to uh, motivate them to display species specific behaviors, especially when there was a lack of space and some of them had to be housed indoors. Many a time animals are housed in the veterinary clinic because they're injured. And even during that time, you, um, we have to provide them with a method to display natural behaviors. When um, spacing is an issue, you can always come up with creative ways of designing simple, effective enrichment devices. Thank you. Next slide, please. Social interactions and housing animals in appropriate social groups uh, is highly significant, and it has, ha has been found by the zoo community. And I had the fortunate opportunity also to examine this in my research. 
that um, animals that are highly social, if they have a severe, um, a severe detrimental influence on their behavior and they do display stress. Uh, one of our enrichment opportunities is to move animals around in their social groups to provide them with opportunity to display uh, social interactions such as grooming one another, play behavior in young animals, reproductive behavior, um, preening, as you can see with our wardrobe ibises. Um, it gets uh, fairly exciting during breeding season when new animals are introduced to one another. We've also tried mixed species exhibits, which have had fascinating, successful results. Um, these are great opportunities as well to motivate animals to display uh, reproductive behaviors and um, other social interactions, which um, um, are fairly important to their behavior repertoire. Next slide, please. A large proportion of the enrichment strategies and enrichment items that we use at our facility are related to feeding. And that's because uh, what we do find with animals that are housed in zoos is that they are um, not motivated to display foraging and exploratory behavior, largely because their diets are provided to them. Um, the most uh, of the zoo community and we, we try to motivate animals to work for their food and we try various ways of getting them to search for their food. One of the primary ways and very simple way that we do this is by sketching their diet. Um, it works successfully with our food cells. Um, it's fascinating to observe them um, after the enrichment has been implemented. Um, especially with species that have a very advanced sense of smell. Um, and you could see them uh, wandering around the exhibit, sniffing in the air, looking for their food. Um, uh, we've used similar strategies with our culture kids. That's our golden lion tamarins and cotton top tamarins. A variety of our birds in our mixed species exhibit um, have their food scattered as well. Um, with species that are lesser evolved, um, like our radiated tortoises, we use um, what we call kebabs, where we have an assortment of an, um, animal uh, food items that are, are placed together. As you can see, we have a kebab here for our radiated tortoises, and they seem to be enjoying it. We also use them for our black parrots uh, very often. Again, uh, we, um, the enrichment Strategies we use, uh, we use a combination. For example, we use kebabs and we place them at different locations every day. Um, so the animals have to search for their food. With our ducks, uh, like the marble teeth here, we use floating fire hose uh, feed uh, baskets that float on the water. The animals have to find their food um, and it could be located anywhere in their pond. Um, with um, most of us, Primate species, since they are arboreal, we have food baskets, as you can see here, that are elevated and their position is changed uh, regularly so that the animals can find them. Uh, we also have to closely monitor that they get fed because sometimes uh, enrichment strategy could have ne negative results and you have to make sure that the animals do not um, uh, to look for their food or give up looking for their diet. Um, their diets um, and the um, use of their diets is a very imperative uh, feature. Next slide, please. Uh, a large proportion of uh, the enrichment devices that we use for our uh, animals that have uh, greater cognitive capacities are puzzles. And um, the zoo community have been using puzzle feeders, um, which are complex, where we use puzzles to feed animals, largely um, uh, because uh, we believe that it um, motivates animals to use their, and to develop um, their cognitive capacity. It gets them to strategize and come up with strategies to find food. And it, uh, many of our um, food puzzles have been designed in-house and they're fairly simple. And, and many of the ones that we use and we use them with a variety of species have been fairly successful. 
And I have a few here which are very simple to design. Um, the one on the bottom left is a, a puzzle feeder that was built by fire horses. Um, the design is very simple and I could share that with you later. And what we do with that, and it's used in multiple um, animal exhibits from exhibits housing felids to primates to even our parrots, is that we um, we crush their food and we include it inside the enrichment device. And we, we prop up the enrichment device at various locations inside the exhibit. The animals are aware because they can smell the food that their food has been um, given to them and they have to search for it. And the searchability and exploratory behavior that it motivates um, is a, a far higher than when the animals get their food in a plate. Um, the middle, uh, the middle image is uh, bamboo pieces with holes in them, and these are uh, again uh, puzzle feeders where we fill the bamboo, which is hollow, with hay, and we place, uh, especially for our insectivores, we place uh, feeder insects in the in the hay. The um, insects that we use to feed our animals are crickets, mealworms. Um, um, uh, fly, flies, and so forth. They have been highly successful because um, many of these insects are desirable by many of our species, especially by our hawk-headed parrots and our golden lion tamarins, as you can see them on the left. Um, and largely when these are, uh, feeder puzzles are, uh, are administered, you can see them uh, observing and trying to get get the insects out. It involves a lot of patience, a lot of strategies um, to actually use these devices. And many a time, um, our golden lion tamarins have been fairly successful in um, acquiring the insects from within. We have to we have to keep in mind that these puzzle feeders are administered to animals who can strategize. We have noticed that these puzzle feeders were fairly unsuccessful with lemurs. While they, while the golden tamarins and spider monkeys found it uh, easy to find um, the insects within, the lemurs could not. We've also used puzzle feeders with our hawk-headed parrots. Um, in these situations, we design a variety of objects using paper mache. As you can see, you have a hollow ball that was made out of paper mache. And within this ball, we place some of the food items like walnuts and treats. And as you can see, that, um, that that's where we're very curious this new enrichment device. With the golden lion tamarins on the top, we use a various different device food puzzles where we use power tools to make holes in devices and um, add the enrichment components to the device. Uh, next slide, please. Animal training is an important feature at our facility. Uh, this again is very basic animal training. Animal training is a fantastic enrichment for our animal residents. Not only does it help them develop their cognitive capacities, it also helps them build a positive bond with their animal care staff. And as you can see here, in animals, um, uh, positive reinforcement Enforcement, primarily for their um, health examinations. We conduct preventive health examinations of all our animal residents on an annual basis. And to actually get them across to our veterinary team, sometimes it can be negative and you're trying to capture them. And, uh, and these capture techniques could have a st stressful uh, impact on our animal residents. To prevent that from happening, many a time we have trained animals to, to get into their carriers. As you can see, a female southern pudu is being trained to use her carrier. The carrier is placed in an exhibit. It's almost like a little den, and uh, we use positive enforcement techniques to reinforcement techniques to get her to be comfortable in there. This makes it far easier for the animal care staff when she has to be taken in for a veterinary exam. Um, similarly, we use target training 
with multiple species, uh, as um, you can see here with our provost provosts and our lemurs, where they are trained to, to reach a certain target. And once they are trained um, to reach a target, then they, that is used as a control. And then we can train them to um, uh, obtain certain goals. Uh, for example, similar to the golden lion tamarind, on the top, we weigh animals regularly. Animal weights help us uh, immensely. It um, answers several questions for us. If an animal is unwell, uh, their weight drops, and we can um, we understand that there's a problem because their weights have dropped. Um, many a time, if animals are pregnant, their weight increases, and um, uh, any fluctuation in weight gives us a sound understanding that the animal situation has changed. Um, a large proportion of our animals have been trained to use their varying scales through positive reinforcement techniques. And in most cases, we use um, food items to train them. And these food items are carefully uh, chosen and are always a part of their diet. Um, we make sure that they don't get additional uh, items in their diet. All the animals' diets, as well as enrichment items, um, including food items, are discussed in a committee and our veterinary staff um, as well. And once they are approved, and that's the only time they are used. Next question. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I didn't bring them up before, but a critical aspect um, in the zoo is enrichment safety. And enrichment have had hazardous results in multiple facilities, including our own. Every enrichment device that's used as a, uh, by our facility is scrutinized, is, um, is uh, checked by a committee and the veterinary team, and only when it's approved, it is used. Um, and it also needs to be uh, approved for specific species. Several enrichment items that are used with certain species are not used with others. Also, also there are personality differences. For example, we have a variety of enrichment items that we use with our snow leopard and our bobcat that we do not use with the fusas because the fusas tend to chew on many items and we are unable to use anything heavy duty, uh, any uh, heavy duty plastic items with fusas. Similarly, we try as much as possible not to include any toxic plants that could be fed upon or chewed upon by our primates. Um, a large proportion of our devices uh, that are available today have batteries or electric components to it. Um, we try that we train all our staff not to use any of these items in the zoo as enrichment have to be very careful on what kind of enrichment devices that we prepare and construct because animals can get stuck in holes, they can get entangled in hammocks. Um, if they are able to chew the enrichment item, they can break off a part and swallow it and asphyxiate. Um, uh, they can get their legs caught in uh, enrichment items. They can also um, uh, eat some food item that might have a disease in it. We have to make sure that all food items that are administered in food enrichment are disease free. Zoos so also have challenges where open outdoor exhibits um, that were um, where enrichment was administered, animals were able to carry these heavy duty enrichment and throw them towards the visiting public and it has been injurious to the visiting public. And that's something that we be careful of as well. Um, apart from that, we have closely monitored and created every enrichment item that we have used in the zoo for a variety of reasons, because we need to check if the enrichment item is successful, how long it takes for an animal to habituate to the item, um, whether it's species specific, if use an item with the bobcat, could be used with the fusas and with snow leopards. All the information about enrichment items are, are um, uh, studied in detail and documented. And that information is shared with all the zoo staff. And it's 
some um, situations, we share them with the zoo community as well. Um, and that's about it. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Ravanti. That was fantastic, and especially to give us a sneak peek, uh, you know, behind the scenes, in, especially in your Mickey Grove Zoo. And uh, I think even the and personally for me, the last slide where you know you give us the enrichment safety uh, details was also an eye opener, and and it's great, and and to see that how closely you monitor each and everything and making uh, enrichment especially as a as a science in which we need to look uh, deeper into uh, unfortunately we have run out of time and we are a little bit uh, uh, you know uh, uh, in terms of behind schedule but having said oh. that i might as well uh, want to take a few questions and because uh, you know we've got some great reviews coming up on the youtube uh, channel chat box so I'll open up and I'll uh, have three questions for each of our key speakers today. And I'll start with uh, uh, Ms. Georgina today. Uh, Georgina, the question uh, which has come up in the chat box of the YouTube channel uh, for, and I'll, I think I'll uh, mark, drive it to you, is that uh, should night shelter enrichment be similar to enclosure enrichment? considering they are small areas. So I, I am assuming it's to do with when you have very limited space and uh, what do you do with it? Mm. Um, it's a good question um, and one that uh, I get asked a lot because people feel quite overwhelmed when um, enrichment is described and they think they need to have a huge amount of space for these animals. Space is, of course, very important, but even more important is what you do within that space and the environment that you provide within that space. So as I said in my presentation, animals can quite often spend about 16 hours of their day shut inside if they are shut inside a part of management practice, um, say from 4.30 in the afternoon to 8.30 in the morning. And those animals might be more active during the nighttime. They might be a nocturnal species. And therefore, and even if they're not, you should still be providing um, an enrichment program for those individuals in that space. So whether it's an indoor space or it's a small space, what you need to do is consider what the animal's um, behavioral needs are. Are they arboreal? Are they terrestrial? Are they social? What are their behavioral needs? And when are they most active? When do they carry out these behaviors? Where, what motivates them to carry out these behaviors? Remembering that not all behaviors are equal and we want to prioritize encouraging those behaviors that are positive and rewarding. Um, you would then consider that space and think about how can you use it both vertically and horizontally. Remember using all that area of space dependent on the species needs and the species priorities. Um, you create a nice rotational enrichment plan that is diverse, that's species appropriate, but key to all of this is ensuring that you evaluate any enrichment that you do. And again, just going, um, reiterating what Avanti said is that safety is paramount. Any new enrichment practice that you put into an enclosure should be consistently evaluated and monitored because any, every animal will react differently to that enrichment. Um, for small spaces, you can add substrate, you can do food hiding, you can um, create perches, you can create um, hammocks. Uh, olfactory spraying, um, spice use is very useful in terms of um, simple enrichment tools that can be used in any size enclosure. And very quickly, I just want to share a video, if that's okay, which is a video of um, a very small gibbon enclosure in a rescue space and as you'll see what they did was ensure that they could meet that species behavioral and physical needs the gibbons have evolved to um, live in high up in the canopies in trees that move around in the wind they want flexibility so if you'll notice and i'll just play that again all those trees stumps here are attached by hoses so that they are movable so you can still provide that breakating space for the individuals even in a small area and very quickly another small video this was something that we designed for um, some macaques in a uh, enclosure in vietnam 
which was fairly barren, as you can see. But we provided a simple foraging box for these individuals. So they actually start hunting and looking for their food instead of it just being thrown on the floor. It was a small space. But what it did is it encouraged some social cohesion, or although a little fighting as well, which you'll see in a minute. Um, but it allowed the animals to look for their food. So even in a very basic enclosure, it gave them something to do and it was species appropriate and encouraged those rewarding behaviours. So I think um, what I'm saying is that don't worry too much if you have limited space, just think about what you can do within that space, which is species appropriate and encourages those rewarding positive behaviours, but is also safe for the animals and also for the people and the keepers who are using that enrichment. I hope that answers some of the question. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Georgina. That was absolutely brilliant. And uh, again, uh, again, amazing videos and, and the way you say it. And, you know, we always feel that it is, oh, yes, this is what we could have done and, and amazing in terms of what you have shown. So thank you so much again. Uh, uh, to save on time, I will now ask uh, Dr. Ravanti a question that has come from the registration uh, forms. Uh, and this is for you, is that can enrichment be used as a curative tool uh, for captive animals, especially those uh, who have already extre uh, you know, exhibiting extreme stereotypic behavior? So what's your view on it? Well, in some situations, um, I had researched um, using some of these tools with um, lion tail macaques when I worked with Indian zoos, where a large proportion of them were brought in um, they were taken in by uh, because of pet trade, confiscated by the forest staff and brought into zoos. But by then, because they had been isolated um, and uh, by the private parties that housed them, they had developed severe behavioral um, problems such as uh, pacing behavior, floating limb, and uh, stereotypic pacing. A large proportion of behaviors were self-aggression. Um, which was a huge challenge. Many a times, stereotypic behaviors, once they have started being displayed, it is more challenging to reduce the proportion of behavior displayed uh, in comparison to preventing the behavior from developing in the first place. But once animals have started displaying these behaviors, I did notice, it, depending on which behavior you're targeting, and I always encouraged uh, targeting specific abnormal behaviors because each behavior can be addressed in a different manner. And in this research study, I was targeting self-aggression because I did observe several adult male lion tail macaques displaying self-aggressive and self-injurious behavior because the aggressive behavior towards their own selves was um, so heavy and so frequent that they were injuring their limbs, they were injuring their shoulders and so forth. Um, the, this was addressed by a simple technique where we provided them with certain forms of enrichment uh, and it was observed that they had started uh, displaying the aggressive behaviors towards enrichment and a greater proportion of their aggressive behaviors di were displayed towards enrichment and uh, lesser towards themselves. So I think self-aggression was addressed to a, a very limited degree, but uh, what was heartwarming to see was that we could address it. And it's uh, similar to uh, stereotypic pacing as well. If we understand the behavioral biology of the species displaying the behavior and focus on certain species, the animal hasn't been able to motivate, uh, the environment of the animal doesn't motivate the animal to perform it. I think those those behaviors can be addressed. I hope I answered the question. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you for uh, you know giving that example as well from your uh, you know uh, thesis work. So that that's again I think has uh, made a very important point of how you know enrichment becomes critical. A uh, final question to Dr. S. P. Yadav. So uh, it is uh, important, and I think everybody feels uh, that way especially in India, that animal keepers, zoo biologists are fairly well paid and well trained, uh, especially uh, when you see their jobs across Europe and America. Uh, is there any scope to make the job of animal keeper as attractive to a qualified young graduate in India uh, as when we compare it uh, to the zoos across the world? 
this so really this question is very very important uh, and very right in saying that uh, we need good qualified highly educated zookeepers in our country i think uh, in india there are number of uh, new zoos are coming under the ppp mode with uh, private partners there are number of zoos which are owned by the private in, uh, industrial houses and public sector undertaking and those zoos though uh, which are earning good good uh, revenue i think they should start uh, employing the highly educated and qualified zookeepers in the same lines as it's happening in the western countries and uh, uh, i think there is a scope of qualified uh, zookeepers in our country but uh, it it will pick up gradually not because most of zoos are owned by the governments state governments and there it will be difficult but i think there is a scope in the zoos which are owned by the private uh, industrial houses and public sector undertaking thank you yes. thank you so much sir and i think this is one of the first steps uh, in terms of thinking aloud and also being able to bring in new ideas and and for this i thank all my speakers expert speakers who have joined us today thank you we have uh, kept you away from your lunch time but uh, once again thank you for joining us across from across the continents i take this opportunity to thank my backroom team back in caesar day and also in mysuru uh, zoo for the excellent uh, backup that they have provided and until we meet next time uh, thank you very much and bye thank, thank you thank you very much thank you bye thank you caesar team for organizing this thank you so much georgina and avanti see you goodbye take bye, care bye bye take care bye.